great program today. And speaking of AFRAC, uh, Dan Kaiser is an associate professor at the University of Minnesota and focuses on soil fertility and nutrient management. He's probably been the biggest recipient of AFRAC awards since the program started. So please welcome Dan Kaiser. I got it. So as Bruce said, um, I'm going to talk today about uh, some of the research I've had funded through AFRIC. Um, I've also, some of this is probably partially funded through Minnesota Soybean. And uh, one of the, the key things about having the AFRIC funding has been looking at core studies to look at some of our nutrient management guidelines. And that's what I've been doing with the uh, majority of this data, trying to do it to continually update some of the guidelines. So what I'm gonna talk about today is some of the timing work we've been doing. I've had a, a couple of studies out um, since I started. Uh, we had one long-term study that was in place for 10 years, looking at timing in rotations. And then the current study, we're looking at fall versus spring applications. So I'm gonna kind of split a little bit today, talking about the two. So I do want to put a plug in uh, for our website right now. We're in the process of updating several of our publications. The corn publications is one of them. Um, the link to get to that is z.umn.edu backslash nutrient MGMT. Um, so you can get a lot of the material for our recommendations there. I also put in a plug for Minnesota crop news because a lot of what we have for research, um, at least in the nutrient management side, we're trying to do weekly releases that highlight several of the projects out there and changes to the guidelines. And also on uh, crop news, you'll get information related to pest management and some other agronomic management of some of the crops. So it's a good spot to go if you want to look at um, just current what's going on and maybe some things that are going to be released moving forward. Um, right now, the corn guidelines are one of the things we're looking at, um, mostly in the side of nitrogen management, but some of the stuff you're seeing today likely will be worked in to that publication. So in terms of timing, you know, I mentioned this uh, just before, when we start talking about timing, we can mean a number of things. Uh, with, with management, uh, timing in a rotation has been kind of one of the bigger questions, and it's one of the things we I tackled first. Um, and if you look at it in terms of um, just fall versus spring application, again, that's the more recent data. And that's kind of, if we look at our guidelines, we have no set recommendations in terms of the timing of fall versus spring. So if you look at it in terms of what we make with our rate recommendations, it's independent of the actual timing, whether you're fall versus spring, and then also timing within the rotation. And we've seen that uh, particularly with phosphorus, that we have flexibility in our rotations. We don't need to apply every year, although we know there's more interest in it currently just by, for pushing for higher yields. So we've been looking at that in general with some of the studies just to make sure that's true. With the higher yields, do we still see the same thing that we've seen historically that particularly if you're dealing with soybean crop that we can look at an application that would be um, for a two year spread ahead of the corn crop and, and see the soybean crop benefit. And um, I know when I started talking about a lot of that data a couple of years ago, when we started, when we ended that project, it was taking a lot of flack from growers out in the Western part of the state with high pH soils. So, and that's one of the, I think the caveats to that, that um, I did update the guidelines, particularly for soybean, that if you're in high pH situations, that it might be something to consider. And I'll talk about that with the fall versus spring application, because that was one of the things that clearly came out when we were targeting that particular study that there are some differences there that need to be addressed. Uh, the other is in season with P and K though, being that they're immobile, we don't really recommend any of that. I know with potassium, we can get away with it, particularly in low cation exchange capacity soils, so silt loam sands, uh, because we know potassium has some mobility. With phosphorus, the reactivity is too high. So if we start looking at our app, our recommendations, our, replicate, our recommendations are really geared towards making the applications ahead of time, um, using the soil test and applying it in the fall or the spring uh, to make sure that uh, that nutrient is there in the soil for the, the root to take it up. So that's really been the challenge. So I've been looking at this and thinking about this a lot with the recommendations and I'll talk at the end some of the changes we've had to the guidelines um, because I think you know looking at when timing is important trying to figure that out is critical because I don't necessarily think that 
looking at our data, we've been looking at specific circumstances, but depending on where you're at, there's, there's some flexibility and timing, and it really depends on how you're managing phosphorus uh, within a particular field and what your, your given soil test are within that field. So one of the things I've been looking at with um, our newer recommendations is providing more data than we've had in the past. Uh, normally, um, if you look at our rate, our tables, we had one set of recommendations that had, it was a rate table that had um, yield goal, and then it had recommendations based on the given soil test you're at. But I know just you talking to a lot of farmers um, that there's different goals that the farmers have. There's different ways they manage phosphorus. So that's one of the things that we've been trying to do, at least with the updates, is to go through and give additional information, looking at risk assessment and looking at different ways to manage phosphorus. Uh, so one of the things I've been looking at is critical soil test levels um, and just tracking that. And certainly if you look at many of the studies that these things tend to change uh, depending on your studies, depending on your... Um, somewhat depending on the, the soil conditions that are within these locations. However, on average, if we look at where we're at about 100% maximum yield, it's, it's around 20 part per million Bray. Um, that would be roughly around 15 part per million or around 15 part per million Olson. Um, and if we go beyond that, then uh, we can start looking at, um, it's, it's really where we start looking at economics as we start breaking this down into different fractions of, of maximum yield, um, just to look at what's our overall risk for being short for phosphorus production. So we've been trying to put this in place. Uh, one of the major challenges I have in the state is carbonates. That's kind of what that arrow shows there is um, the correlation when you get carb put carbonates into the mix. And that's actually the uh, Bray test. Um, and it's one of the reasons we recommend the Olson in the state um, is because of uh, how that affects the carbonates. So yeah, like I said, you get differences in, in what you see for the, the critical levels, but they follow pretty closely. And when we start talking about looking at timing, I think this really uh, is pretty significant when you start looking at what you can do. Because as we get towards that critical point, essentially timing is going to be less important just because when we're managing phosphorus at that point, we're looking at a situation where the soil is supplying the majority of the, the phosphorus and we're just replacing the phosphorus that's being taken up. So in terms of uh, timing, it's, it's going to be less important at that given point in time. You have more flexibility when you're looking at a removal-based system just because the uh, crop isn't reliant on the fertilizer you're, you're applying. And we, we saw that in particular with a study we had funded with AFRIC trying to look more closely at answering the question, does high phosphorus in, or equal higher yield? So this was a larger study we had across the state sites ranging from Crookston, uh, Waseca, Lamberton, Becker, Morris, and um, looking at um, across the state, seeing similar results no matter where we're at. And this was looking at the key point is, um, can we fertilize a low, get the same yield as maintaining a high? So what this data shows is with and without phosphorus at given starting soil test points, what was our relative yield produced? So looking at a low situation, we're looking at uh, roughly around 80% of our maximum yield without phosphorus, a medium, we're looking at about 95%, then we get to the high, seeing really applied phosphorus not giving as much of a yield boost. So again, looking at this in the, in the case of timing that as we go along, we're again, relying more on soil phosphorus, the higher we go, so timing becomes less than an issue. But this was an interesting study. Again, this was a, a longer term AFRIC study that um, really started to kind of give us some indication of whether or not some of these um, really aggressive builds if they were needed within and across the state. So this was kind of a key component going into um, some of the, the studies we were doing or the, the longer term stuff that I've been working on within the last five to 10 years. So one of the things I'm gonna show at the end um, is the change to the guidelines where I did add a maintenance-based um, approach, just looking at economics and trying to look at what was the best option. Should you be looking at targeting a critical soil test level and how to, to deal with that? But with timing, again, it's, it's just less important. If we look at it, um, if it's field soil tests above the critical level, then um, you look at the applied fertilizer really just replacing what you're taking out of the soil. So the, the crop might use some of that phosphorus that's in the fertilizer, but it just doesn't need it um, when it comes down to that. Um, we know that there might be a starter effect, um, particularly for band placement, that's a whole different story. I mean, in terms of broadcast, it just becomes more less important 
at that given point in time. Um, the thing about a maintenance approach, it would give more flexibility for timing. Again, and um, I'll show some of the data on that. Does timing matter? That's gonna be, I think, one of the key points. So if it does matter, then if you're at a higher point, it would give you more options. The question though is if you can get there. And that's one of the challenges and one of the, the reasons why I did not get completely get rid of the old set of guidelines we had in Minnesota, because you know there's soils out there that are just hard to build and maintain. So that was one of the, the, the questions and then how do we manage some of those scenarios. Um, so again, the first thing that we we're looking at when I started looking at this was, does timing matter within the crop rotation? And that was kind of the key point coming in is what I really wanted to know is, um, are we seeing any um, benefit from doing a single year spread ahead of every crop within a corn soybean rotation? So back in 2009, we set up uh, three trial locations. Um, had one location, we had one at Morris, which is a high pH situation. Uh, pHs were ranging from seven and a half to eight within that field. Uh, Lamberton was uh, slightly more acidic. We were dealing with probably five and a half to six pHs. So situations that we're seeing more commonly. And one thing I will say, the lower your pH, I mean, we do see some of the same issues with tie-up. So if, you, if we talk a lot about high pH and calcium being an issue, the lower you go, iron and aluminum become a problem. So it's one of the things that's been interesting with some of the data at Lamberton is we're seeing some of the same yield responses we see in high calcium situations with these very low pHs. So looking at it, if you factor in a low phosphorus with a low pH, still seeing a very high return in some of those given soils. And then St. Charles, um, this is more of a neutral pH. The, so, the field is actually limed after year one. And that was an interesting um, story when you started looking at the soil test data because we went from a soil test of around 10 up to a soil test close to 20. And then it took roughly around 10 years or so to see that soil test drop back down. And I'm not gonna show any of the data from the site at St. Charles because we just did not see a yield response at that site. So seeing uh, these silt loams um, at times, we just see that it seems like fertility with depth is, is greater with some of these soils, which might factor into that but I just don't always see a strong response on some of the sites. It was the Lamberton and the Morris site where we were really looking at um, some differences. So these studies, what they were is multiple rates of phosphorus. We applied them in a two-year rotation, either all before corn, all before beans, or I was using a two-third split ahead of corn, one-third ahead of beans. So I wasn't doing a 50-50 split. Um, looking at the data, and I'll show you that, it seems like corn favors the application ahead of it better than soybeans. So that was one of the things that it made more sense to go with a higher rate ahead of the corn crop, particularly with MAP or DAP, having nitrogen applied with it. If you could credit that back, at least gives you a bonus in, in being able to reduce the nitrogen you need to apply. The other treatment we were looking at is just a simple, you know, if you wanted to go with the broadcast ahead of the beans, looking at whether or not we could get away with five gallons of 1034 ahead of the corn. So giving me kind of a, a band because that is an option, I know for some growers, looking at, um, you know, if that would work out um, just as well as the broadcast ahead of the corn. And we were using a triple in this case, I don't think it matters a whole lot. Um, the later study we're using MAP, uh, just because uh, if you look at triple versus MAP, there are some differences in how it reacts. Um, MAP will be more acidic as it's dissolving, or it's, it's reacting to the soil. Triple and DAP will be more alkaline. So that was one of the thoughts, particularly with higher pH soils, that there might be greater availability with the acidity that's produced with MAP. So this table, I'm gonna kind of explain how to read it. Um, what this essentially is, is I took um, individual treatments within this study that were comparisons um, with the different timings and we did contrast comparisons and we're trying to estimate out what the overall response is for one timing versus the other. So what the numbers represent essentially is if you take the row, uh, for instance, this one that says before corn on the top and you subtract it from the column before soybean, that if it says NS, it's not significant. There's no difference. If there's a number there, if it's positive, that means what's in the row is higher than what's in the column. So what we saw at Lamberton essentially is that before corn and before beans, really no difference between the two. Um, they were better than the split. And then the starter before corn and the, um, and the broadcast for four beans, really no difference from before corn or before beans, although it was also no different from the split. So I'd kind of put that between the two. It likely wasn't yielding quite as much as the broadcast application uh, before each crop, but it, um, it didn't seemingly do a, a lot different. So this is really saying that the split really wasn't giving us an overall you know, better return. 
On the corn side then at Morris, it was before corn. I mean, clearly had the advantage. So we were better off at that site putting broadcast before corn. Uh, no difference though, again, between the starter and broadcast strategy for beans versus um, broadcast for beans or the corn strategy. So again, I kind of put it between that, it likely wasn't giving me enough. And I'll show some of the data we have with that. And I think, you know, we look at starter only, um, probably not giving us as much unless you go with a higher rate and there's some risks involved with that. Uh, the main thing, though, if you look at the right side, their soybean um, it really didn't matter. So timing on the soybean side didn't matter. It mattered more for corn. So in terms of planning purposes, it's kind of made sense based on what we've seen in the past. Um, soybean, I've seen, or we've seen uh, for potassium, some of the same things, although we do see some split applications at times work better with, with potassium. But for phosphorus, really, um, if you're looking at a single year spread um, for two year, or a two year spread a, a, over corn, that seems to be as effective as anything else. So again, it favors some application ahead of the corn. And that was one of the interests I had with that starter treatment. Um, I didn't want to go too high with that treatment. I know that heavier soils, we know that there is a little more leeway with it. Um, five gallons of 1030 furrows giving me roughly 20 units P205. So it's not a lot. I mean, it'd be enough and, and some of the data I'll show you enough if you're a medium and high situation, but for a low situation, we know that that's just not going to be enough. And that could be part of what's going on within some of these sites. Um, soybean itself, they don't care, but again, I think pH is a big factor there. And again, that's the follow-up I'll show you here with the more recent study looking at the timing as we're really targeting some of those specific soils and seeing some positive results for application right directly ahead of the soybean. So I guess I would suggest at least starter ahead of the corn. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I wanna follow up on this though, because there were some, some things that kind of came out of the current study that I'm, I'm, you know, I think there might be some benefit there, but I still think you need to split, particularly for in a low situation, you need some starter and broadcast. It's not gonna be enough to get you through. If you're looking at trying to mitigate high prices, there's still enough return with low testing soils that you can get away with some broadcast and starter, particularly in corn production to uh, make, make that pay even with higher prices. So again, carbonates, that's kind of the issue we're looking at with the current study. So our current trial is a fall spring trial. And again, um, looking at the timing and the rotation, we always applied in the fall uh, for the majority of these sites. We never really looked at that fall spring timing within that study because we just weren't able to just because of the size of the trial. So the follow-up trial was then to look at essentially fall versus spring. So looking, we're looking at actually here are applications from about a mid to late October. Uh, we went a little earlier on some of the sites going to um, that were coming out of soybeans. Um, just to try to get the fertilizer on ahead of fall tillage, um, but generally about mid-October, and then we had an application within about a week of planting. So it's kind of what we we're targeting within this particular study. This was more of a rate trial with lower rates, and that was one of the things that is a little bit of a challenge, and you'll see in some of the data is that we didn't maximize yield, even with the 90-pound rates. We're targeting some um, low testing soils, but I wanted to make sure that we had low enough rates that we could separate out the fall versus spring, because that was the most important part of this particular study. Again, MAP was our source. Um, we're, so we were trying to look at a situation, particularly in carb where we had high carbonates, where we had a more acidifying uh, soil to see if that would help with phosphorus availability. Um, we didn't have any comparisons with the other ones. So with DAP and that, I don't know in terms of a comparison with that, we were only using one source of this, this particular study. So I just wanna show you some of the soil tests we had. The main thing there is in the yellow, the red and the right, that was carbonates. Um, we were do, dealing with anywhere from about 0.2 up to about 16.2, uh, I think was our highest at our locations. So we're trying to deal with sites. I was trying to target sites about four to 5% or higher on some of these locations, just to get into a situation where I've seen in the past where it seems like we see a lot of fixation with that. Um, soil phosphorus tests generally were low. We had a couple sites, um, Benson and, 2019, that was a very high. Um, a few of the sites, most of them really were coming out of the soybean just because those that had, had phosphorus applied ahead of the corn. So we're seeing some of that phosphorus being picked up likely that was, that was made for that two-year rotation. But just looking again at carbonates, um, we had a lot of them though that were kind of in that you know one to 3% range, but still had some sites that were relatively high. And that was important for the study based on the goals that we're trying to achieve. So do crops vary? in timing for fall versus spring. Uh, this is just a summary of seven of our cornfields. Um, I left out Lamberton and uh, one of the Crookston sites. So Lamberton from last year, we actually saw the opposite um, where the, on average, we look at the sites, corn responded better to spring application. Lamberton last year, fall application did better. And I don't know 
if that's uh, just an issue potentially with the dry conditions, uh, mainly if we had shallow tillage, our phosphorus was in the upper surface, that maybe the deeper tillage with the fall application worked better. But in general at these sites, if you looked at it in terms of return or you looked at in terms of efficiency, we're roughly um, twice as efficient with a spring application of phosphorus in these, these higher pH soils with corn. Soybean was the opposite. It was, it was interesting because soybean, if you look at it, um, linear responses, um, we didn't really maximize yield. The, the difference was very relatively small. We're looking at roughly about a bushel difference between um, where it favored fall application. With corn, we we're looking at roughly, um, it was roughly seven bushels um, per acre higher um, for the spring application. So seeing a definite yield advantage there. And I dropped that arrow in um, at one of the points. Uh, essentially, if you looked at corn with the spring application, we were able to maximize yield with 60 units P205. With fall uh, application, it was still going up beyond the 90 pound range. So I'm gonna show some economics um, on this. Actually, I mean, I, I fit a linear line to both of these. It actually is more of a, a linear plateau where it should plateau out around the uh, 60 pound range for the, um, the the spring application. So kind of interesting on the two of them, the difference, but it would make some sense if corn really responds to the, the, um, the fresh applications. And it seems like that's the case, particularly in these locations. But I'm gonna show some of the soil test data because that's been interesting. We took soil samples in June just to see you know, what fixation or try to get an idea of potentially what fixation potential was in some of these soils. And that data was interesting looking at some of that in terms of um, the, the relative soil test differences with the fall versus spring applications with the rates we applied. So I did look at some economics of this. Um, I use 175 mainly because that was within where the curve was. And you have to realize that we had some lower yielding sites on this. So that's kind of why it's pulling the average yield potential down. So I tried to pick a spot that was on the curves where we could hit both linear, linear lines that were within the data points that we had. So the economic analysis, what I'm assuming here is a 10% price increase for spring application. So what I'm looking at, um, two scenarios, 50 cents a unit, uh, $5 per bushel cash price, corn, um, 12 bushel soybean, looking at uh, 50 cents a unit, P205, and then looking at 80 cents a unit, just to look at increased price, what the difference between the, the two timings were. So at 175 bushels, we look at essentially um, optimal, uh, or, or it took a 71 pounds P205 in the fall versus 38 pounds in the spring. For soybean at 52, it was 39 fall and um, 70 in the spring. So again, they're flipped just because of the, the difference between the timing. So looking at overall return, spring application at $5 per bushel cash price, 50 cent a unit P205 was $14 per acre for spring and for corn. If you increase that to 80 cents per pound, it was larger. So again, that's just widening the gap just because of the, the fertilizer prices and that overall efficiency that it was, was even with higher yields, it made more sense for the spring application. And with soybean, we're looking at around 18 for the fall and then 30, or 18 for the profit for the fall application, then 30 again, if you increase the profitability. So it's kind of an interesting story here. I didn't expect them to be different like this, but it was consistent across the locations. And I'll have two more locations. I've got a couple of sites at Crookston we're going out in 2022, and then this, this trial will be, be um, finished. But overall, looking at it, Interesting, essentially, that we're seeing differences in the two and some considerations, at least for, um, for corn production. And that's really where I'm looking at right now. I think one of the major questions is, can I go with a starter spring, then broadcast fall with corn to get away with some of the, or to get around some of the sufficiency issue? So that was kind of one of the questions I have um, that, that has to be followed up with future research. So again, corn likes fresh applications. So if I look at a recommendation, um, you at least have something on. I mean, that might be kind of favor having a starter application for some of these low testing soils. Again, I go back to my comments earlier, the higher your soil test though, I think the less important this is because again, you're looking at essentially that the higher you go, the, the crop isn't reliant on the fertilizer you apply. So this is really looking at situations if you're managing low testing soils, which a lot of these, in, these, these fields, particularly with high pH issues, likely those farmers are gonna have some sort of starter combination. So that's kind of what I was looking at as, as an option for this. Um, and then they also these low, these um, low P soils that have very acidic, those are gonna be some of the same things, I think, looking at it in terms of, of the numbers. So in terms of management, uh, at least soybean again fall, that seems to work, but corn really favors at least having something on right before the application. <clears throat> 
So one of the things we're doing is we're looking at June soil tests, and that was just to get an idea of what kind of uh, potential, again, fixation we might have within these fields. And these are just two scenarios. This is Lamberton, where we had a more acidic soil, so again, closer to a pH of five, versus Morris, which has had a, a pH closer to seven and a half to eight. The red dots on top are the spring applications. So that's showing soil test increase from phosphorus supplied in the spring. Um, this is, again, samples taken in about mid-June versus um, the blue line, which is the fall application. You can see uh, some widening differences, particularly with the higher rates of phosphorus applied. So looking at this in terms of the difference we're seeing, um, kind of showing clearly that that time of reaction that the phosphorus has, it's lessening the actual, um, it's lessening the, um, the phosphorus are able to extract that, which ideally is related to the available fraction. And if you plot this in versus relative crop response, you can get um, a, a model with the June data that, that seems to fit with the response. So again, it seems like the, the crop is responding somewhat to these differences in um, some of the differences we're seeing with, with the yield itself. So again, showing that the more time you have, it likely would explain kind of why we're seeing some of these differences, particularly for corn. For soybean, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But for corn in general, we see that, um, you know, this could be one of the factors we see that um, is giving us some of these difference. So high carbonate soils, a greater potential for P fixation. Again, we've got a lot of calcium in these soils, but again, low, low pH soils are gonna give us some of the same issues with iron and aluminum. So those two in terms of it can have some of the, the same issues. Um, we didn't really um, study soybean response at pH less than five. And that's one of the things I can't say. Corn, again, um, it kind of seemed to, to fit with that. And um, again, starter is really what we're looking at right now. And uh, we have looked at starter in the past. Uh, one of the, the studies I worked on with Jeff Fetch, we were looking at a scenario where we were looking at starter in combination with broadcast, looking at variable rate applications, looking at starter rates up to about seven and a half gallons of 1034.0. So looking at two and a half, five and seven and a half starter only versus starter plus a, a removal rate of phosphorus. And this is for corn only. And what this data summarizes is essentially low, medium, and high soil test P situations, looking at responses to the starter with and without the broadcast. And looking at the data on the low side, you can see um, we saw a significant yield increase um, to the two and a half gallon starter rate, but really no, no difference between the two and a half, five, and seven and a half. And we couldn't achieve maximum yield with that. So we needed some broadcast and with the removal rate, actually we really didn't see a whole, a whole great benefit from the starter. So the combination of the two, I think um, if you started looking at crediting the, the, the phosphorus and the starter is important because again, if you're over applying it on the broadcast side, you're likely to get the starter effect early in the season, but not see a benefit in the, in the yield at the end of the season. Where the starter only strategy did work was a medium and high situations, and it would make sense. Again, we know that in a medium and high situation that um, in the low situation, there's a low probability the soil is gonna be able to supply all the phosphorus where it needs, but in the medium and high, we have more flexibility. So again, this is kind of one of the questions, and I think one of the things we'll probably follow up with with some of the studies to look at, again, look at that fall versus spring application, but do it with and without a starter and just see different rates and see kind of what that optimal level is. It's kind of on, on the docket and one of the next things I'm thinking about doing once we finish with this initial cut of the data moving forward. So I guess just wrapping up here, um, one of the other things we've been putting in the guidelines has been looking at um, the meaning or what's the meaning of your soil test, which essentially is looking at this table, which is in the current corn and soybean publications, which identifies the probability of response that you'll see some sort of um, significant yield increase from phosphorus application based on the different uh, soil test levels. So my little dots and very low and up to very high. Um, what it gives in this table is the expected time that pea fertilizer will increase corn grain yield, ranging from around 80, around 80, uh, around 90 percent of the time down to around 10 percent. So even in the very low, we see that there's a, a small chance that we'll see a yield response. Although if you look at the expected yield without phosphorus fertilizer, really once we get to the high and very high on average, we're within about 1 percent maximum yield. So in terms of a risk assessment tool, this does tend to work nice in terms of identifying areas of the field that's gonna be more profitable to apply phosphorus. And this is really the best way we can do it, just based on the given data. I don't get the nice yield response from phosphorus we get with nitrogen, so developing an economic model becomes hard. So looking at these, um, these expected times that you're looking at some of these probability, this data is really the best things we can do because the economics aren't straight. <clears throat> 
just aren't straightforward. So again, I think timing could be a consideration that needs to be made. It really depends on your, your soil test level and your, um, if you're high or low pH situation, I think it's gonna be more critical than anything else. So again, the higher you go, the less of an issue timing is going to be. So that's one of the things to kind of consider with that. Um, it's gonna be more of a situation for soils that are really hard to manage and build phosphorus, that timing is something that you really need to be more critical on. So that's kind of where we're building that right now, moving forward. So just before I wrap up here, I just wanna give a couple updates of what we're looking at with guidelines right now. Um, these, uh, the corn guidelines and the soybean guidelines were updated in 2020, um, where I didn't get rid of the old set of guidelines, but what I did was add in a separate set that was on the yellow ones, which is a removal-based system. And what I was trying to do with this is I was trying to look at economics and see where it was more economical to remove. If you're going to run a removal system, where is it most economical? So looking at my data, looking at building up and drawing down to a specific point, at what point at which do we see essentially the economics work not work out for the removal-based system? And that's kind of the way this um, situation is structured around. So if you see, look at zero to 10, uh, we're using our current guidelines, which recommend more than removal, um, which hopefully will build you although it may not do that if you have build if you have high pH situations. And again, that's one of the reasons why I left the old recommendations in place just because of pH being an issue and it's maybe not necessarily that important to build and not um, feasible to build in some of those soils. So zero to 10, we use the current recommendation. If you're looking at 100% removal somewhere between 10 and 20. And I think that really depends on situations with your cash rental situation or your own, if you own the land how high you wanna go and how much money you wanna stick into phosphorus. And that's why we don't have an optimal class right now in these guidelines, just because um, I wanted to leave some flexibility in growers to identify where that optimal class is, just depending on, you know, particular land tenure was, was one of the more important things. Then um, like the other guidelines, we start getting above um, 20 part per million, then it's more of a removal based strategy. Um, looking at it in terms of an overall risk, for not getting a positive return becomes very high at that point in time, particularly for removal base. And we know that we can draw down to around 20 to 25 part per million somewhere in there and still be at 100% at maximum yield. So again, this just gives kind of a found, um, uh, just a foundation for what we're seeing um, for the economics for a removal based strategy. I have been updating that lower left table yearly. Um, that's looking at the removal numbers. So this is looking at median values for P and K and also the range in values. Um, you have to realize that um, while we, we do give a median value, that there is a, a, a pretty wide range in that data. So in terms of generating exact removal, it's not an exact science because you're using a lot of rules of thumb for this. Um, but just at least giving you an idea what those numbers are. And we've got over 10,000 points in this database right now. So the numbers really haven't changed all that much based on um, what we have. And there are some discrepancies. If you'd look at say Iowa's recommendation, uh, they use, I think, closer to the end of that upper end of that range um, for the removal. I've been using the median value for it because, again, I don't think it really matters. We know that with a lot of our data, particularly with removal, that we don't have to hit exact removal year after year after year to get to keep the soil test where we want to be. So, again, this is just a, a situation where we're providing more information to growers um, for making these decisions um, and having that out front in our guidelines for use um, when you're coming up with the fertilizer guidelines. Uh, the only other change um, is for soybean um, in our current table. Uh, if you go back to our older table, any of you that were, if you're using the uh, equation, uh, it would give you no, or it'd get, the equation would give you a recommendation for the medium class or table said nothing for a recommendation. So based on the data, we do see that a small percentage of the time we see some response in that medium class. So I added in, uh, in that yellow, uh, a set of recommendations for the medium for soybean. Um, so that'll be coming out with this, this revision that'll be coming out this spring. And this again is just to be consistent with what we have with the, um, the equation with that because I was getting a lot of complaints with people doing um, fertilizer management plans because they had zero in the table, but then the equation was giving us a response. So it's, it's something relatively minor, but again, that, that um, response table that I had in the updated for corn, that's in, or that, that, um, that recommendation then that upper left is also in the soybean guideline publication right now. And those are the only two right now that we have moving forward. So again, it's been interesting. Uh, some of the data I didn't expect, particularly the Africa, the new one, I didn't expect to see as much of a difference. And I didn't expect to see the difference we saw 
between the two crops, but it is something to consider. I mean, I don't think, again, it's going to be 100% of the fields you're going to see that timing effect become critical, but it is something to watch out for and to think about. And again, moving forward, I think the starter option is something to kind of look at because I know we need to have some flexibility there, particularly P and K, where we see more importance or more um, focus of that going on in the fall of having um, just more, having an idea of, can we get around at least some of these issues if that is indeed happening in the field, we see this penalty, you know, can we get away with some other strategies and still be able to give us the flexibility of the timing of application? So with that, I wanna thank you for your time. And uh, Bruce, are we ready? We have some questions right now. Okay, so the first question is when you will be updating guidelines. Uh, we're working on the publications now. Um, the corn one, the, the only thing I have left on that is to look at updating the uh, nitrogen guidelines. And I'm looking at that data. I'll probably be looking at that this week. Um, we're, I've got somebody else working on the updates because we're updating all the nutrient guideline publications. So all the, the smaller crops and stuff, um, everything's being updated to go into the newer um, style. And I'm trying to make a new book. We used to have that large book that had all crops in it. So we're trying to get that all remade. So corn, it'll probably take a little bit longer. Um, whenever I can get the soybean one, they get that update done on that. We'll have that one released because there's less to do on that. So it'll be sometime this spring, I'll have a news release on crop news. Uh, for that when that gets done. So the question is why so much more P2O5 in spring for soybeans? And that's, you know, kind of has me scratching my head a little bit. Um, you look at in terms of soybean, how they root it. I mean, there could be a difference, you know, potentially maybe having the deeper phosphorus um, with uh, some tillage may have an impact for that. Um, that's one of the things that with Lamberton, um, in 2021, again, low yields, uh, dry conditions, we looked at yields maximizing around a, a, at maximum around 120 bushels to the acre. And it was close to 10 to 15 bushel difference uh, where favored the fall application. So I'm kind of wondering if some of that is just fertility with depth and maybe it's, it's something to do with that, with beans, since we're, we're generally gonna be more aggressively tilling the corn crop um, with, with more aggressive tillage, the corn residue um, coming in. So that's the only thing I can really think of that might be some difference between the two, but it didn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, it's small, it's nothing like corn. I mean, it's a bushel, so it isn't um, like corn. We're looking at uh, around seven bushel on average difference between the two timings. Soybean was, was so much smaller. Into a presentation. Oh, we got two more up on screen. Um, okay, is the recommendation for banding fertility with strip till application still half the broadcast rate? That's one of the things we're looking at now. Uh, Jeff Vetch is a study we're looking at um, banding. It's not in strip till, but um, we're not seeing as much of a benefit. Um, I think, you know, Jeff would be one to ask on that, particularly with phosphorus. Potassium, I mean, visual effects. I mean, I'm not sure as much the yield effects on that. So that's one of the things we'll be looking at. Um, it, theoretically, it should be greater the lower your soil test. So if you're in a medium to high soil test and you're banding, you're likely not gonna see the benefit at that point. But um, a lot of that data, it's, it's old. It stems back to data probably you know, 30, 40 years ago, and it's been hard to replicate across. So that's one of the things we're looking at right now with that, um, just, to, just to make sure. For starter applications, are you able to comment if there's any yield response between 1030 furrow compared to other fertilizers that claim to be more readily available? Um, not as much, we've done some comparisons. I haven't seen a whole lot of difference. I mean, a lot of what we've been seeing with starter, I think what makes a bigger difference is the amount of nutrients you apply. And for yield response, that seems to be the big thing. It seems to be how much total nutrients you're applying. So if you're picking a fertilizer, that's why I use 1034 a lot, just because we get 34% um, P205, it's going to be the highest concentration we can get with a lower rate. So that's why I like that source. It's easier to get 10, 20, 30 pounds with 1034 versus other sources. But um, 1034 does have some orthophosphate in it. Ortho is more available than poly, but it tends to convert the poly over relatively quickly. So I don't expect any um, difference. <laughs> 
And then fall tillage effect, fall application. I mean, that could be, I don't know. That's one of the things that we haven't been able to replicate. And that's one of the things to be interesting looking at tillage depth on that and see if that indeed it maybe is some of the issue we see with this. Maybe it's depth and, and just um, if we're incorporating it deeper with fall, maybe that doesn't favor corn just because it's getting a lower concentration at a certain point. So we're maybe getting a starter effect just by having a higher concentration if it's incorporated at a shallower depth. And that, so that's I think one of the things um, potentially with with beans that could be coming to play as well. So, okay. that thank you. Very good, thank you, Dan.